à la mode is a shorter version of the talk show à la mode and is presented online with one or maximum two guests, either on link or on stage here with me. The talk show à la mode is presented twice a year at Uppsala Concert and Congress in Sweden and uh, is a platform for the arts, music, dance, visual arts, uh, design, fashion and social issues. Uh, and that's why we have a lot of artists who are guests. And today I'd like to invite Andrea Star Rees. Welcome. You're a photojournalist and you're here on link from New York. Thanks for having me, Maud. And Star, you and I, we know each other from the 80s. So I've followed you a little bit over the years and you have developed and evolved into a photojournalist. And can you talk a little bit about how that transition happened? Because when I knew you, that you were in the arts and doing video art. Yes, I began my career as a video artist, making films, short films and video, and with the heavy on the collaboration with dance. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, and I lived right there at Ground Zero. And I was there that day and witnessed it, and so I, I filmed it. And I continued taking videos in the days and weeks afterwards. Later on, what I realized it was that my camera had gotten me through that. And it having purpose, having that kind of purpose, being able to do something, to, to give something, um, made a huge difference in how I was able to uh, navigate through uh, an incredibly difficult historic time. So uh, that changed my life. And it eventually led to also a transition to photojournalism. Once I picked up the still camera and started taking photographs, uh, social documentary uh, photographs, I just never looked back. I, I have, uh, you know, I found what I, what my passion is. Mm -hmm you have uh, made a couple of very interesting and disturbing and stark uh, photojournalistic series. One is called Urban Cave and the other one is called Disorder. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about them? I'm drawn to marginalized, underserved uh, people. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know why. I mean, I know that... Uh, I, I'm very uh, I'm very struck by what I find in them, their courage, their resilience, uh, their welcome to me, you know, how they take me in, how they uh, keep you know treat me as 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 not so much an outsider. Uh, and but more than that, it's not even about me. it's 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 just what I, the stories I find in their situation, their condition, and the importance that it is that people see it. And also, these are mostly hidden, hidden um, communities, hidden societies. Uh, and I think that uh, that really uh, attracts me as well. Mm -hmm. It's what it's what people don't want you really to photograph. So I look for what people don't want me to photograph. <laughs> what was your first trip to to Asia? What 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 happened? Like what? How did you meet this these people? It was in Indonesia after the uh, Merapi volcano erupted, and I was there with my fixer and I saw a homeless man walking along the road and he appeared to have a, possibly a mental illness. And I asked my fixer, what happens to people here that are mentally ill? And he said, I don't know, but I think it's bad. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, that's, that's our story. I'll be back in a month. Okay. And that's how we began. Mm -hmm. But that has been over quite a number of years this this research I've been this... doing this work for nine years and what drives you because the people I photograph are waiting mm -hmm. they're waiting for better conditions they're waiting for rec recognition 
They're waiting for uh, treatment. They're waiting for a, a, a better life. Mm. Star, when we talked the other day, uh, you talked about something about power, you empowering them. The people I photograph have absolutely no power. They have no control over their lives. Many of them are shackled. They're in cages. They're locked in rooms. They have absolutely no power. And I bring them, I bring them power. They have the ability to uh, consent or not to consent to participate. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes people say, well, do they really know what they're doing? Yes, they do. They absolutely do know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And this is a moment when their voice is recognized, their image, they can use their condition, their surroundings, their image by allowing me to see it, by allowing me to document it. Mm -hmm. It gives them power. They are speaking out and saying, this is my life. Do you visit the same people several times? Yes, yes. Yeah. Whenever mm -hmm. I can, I revisit, whether it's in a shelter or a home, uh, some places. Uh, one place I've been to, I was just thinking this morning, I've been to it, I think, more than 10 times okay. over the nine years. Mm -hmm. Yes, I go back and I go back and I revisit and I revisit. And I don't tell people I'm coming. I just show up. It's very, very complicated. The people that run these places where uh, tremendous abuses are happening, I, get, I believe in my heart that they genuinely be think and believe they are helping people mm -hmm. and that their job is helping people. They have not had training. They're not getting support especially significant support. Occasionally, they get a little bit of food from the government, but uh, many of them tell me they haven't had that in years. Let's just move into what the current situation you're in, because it is May 11th, we are recording this, and the corona situation has been for, for a number of weeks. You're in New York. Uh, what is your situation? Because you were, were not supposed to be in New York now. You were supposed to be away working, right? Actually, I was supposed to be in Indonesia now, continuing with my personal work. And I, of course, was not able to go because of travel restrictions and because of the danger. And honestly, uh, they would not want me to visit at this time. They mm. would not want an outsider coming in and perhaps bringing disease in. So I have had to do what many people are doing. I'm just at home. But I am partnering with a local non-governmental organization, right. mm -hmm. uh, an organization of activists. It's the Indonesian Mental Health Association, mm -hmm. PJS are the initials. And we have put together a multimedia campaign of photographs and some video clips and text that was written by PJS that they have been using with their meetings with the government to advocate, to beg, to urge the government to do something to prevent uh, this, these high risk situations from becoming hotspots mm. of COVID outbreaks. Mm. Because the places that I visit, uh, the shelters are uh, overcrowded, the nutrition is bad, the, uh, they're not clean. Oftentimes people must eat, sleep, defecate in the same area, mm. uh, right where they are. With, uh, and so the conditions are so ripe for uh, a hot spot for the spread of the virus from one person to another. And many of them, uh, their health condition is not great. Uh, mm. Some places they they tell me they don't get enough to eat, they don't have enough food, they're very thin, and I I don't know you know these are my friends I'm I'm fighting for their lives mm. that's what I'm doing mm. and PJS is fighting for their lives and so far the government has been open and and listening to the suggestions we have come up with that they have come up with and I. I just, uh, I, I'm crossing my fingers and, and uh, praying and 
hoping to hear that the government will give some oversight. The problem is that nobody even knows where these places are. The government has mm -hmm. no idea how mm -hmm. many shelters are out there. They don't have any database, any list. I gave them every address I have, every contact I have, everyone that Human Rights Watch uh, has, uh, and that was more than 50, but they have no idea. And But we tell them, just ask the local police. They will know. Mm -hmm. th th mm -hmm. These places are findable, but we have to give them even that information. Mm -hmm. You said some uh, at some point that you don't take pictures, you document. Can you describe the difference for you? Well, I think, uh, how do I want to say this? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not trying to make works of art or anything like that. I'm just trying to communicate. I'm just trying to gather evidence mm. of what is going on. I'm trying to be a vehicle for other people to share what they want me to see. And uh, what I do is I go in and the very first thing I do is, is talk to the people individually if I can and get consent and explain to them uh, how to let me know that they, you know, if they don't want to be photographed and what the photographs, how the photographs will be used. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me how people will do what they can to show what they want to be seen. They, uh, they know that I want natural, they watch what I do they see what interests me. And sometimes they'll literally, you know, tell me, oh, go over and, and photograph there, go into that room and photograph there, mm -hmm. talk to this person. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very much co collaborative. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing I really want to say, um, if it's okay, is that the most important thing I do ha is not even photographing. Uh, the most important thing I do is to ask, to beg, to urge people to keep going, to not give up, to just keep living, keep living. Please survive this. Hang on. Never give up. Uh, I talk to them about, uh, you know, the, the, I let them know that they can get better. Many of them don't even know that, mm -hmm. that yes, you can get better, that doctors doctors can sometimes help people mm. that have the you know the condition that you are are struggling with mm. and uh that maybe you can't see a doctor now but when you can please go and i tell them i know people like you that have what you have that are you know that have gotten better that have been able to go to school that have jobs mm. and this is this is news to some of them mm. uh and i i just i'm really begging people to keep living some of these people have been locked up for 10 years mm. and what part of what job. draws you i mean because you said at one point that um not everyone can take pictures like this not everyone can do I mean, it's like, how do you cope with this, what you're doing? It's, you never know what you're going to be able to do. Um, it's, I can do sad. I can do, I can do really dark, dark, sad things. Uh, I can, I can, I can do stories that carry a very heavy PTSD load, and I don't know why. I don't know what it is, why I can do sad, why I can do uh, devastation. Maybe because uh, I do it intimately, as intimately as I can. Mm -hmm. I don't try to keep distance. Maybe I'm not the best person to be doing this, but I'm the one that showed up. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one that keeps showing up and I keep coming back and I keep coming back. Uh, but this is the door that opened for me. I kicked that door open, uh, uh, you know, when when I saw the man walking down the road. He kicked the door open mm -hmm. for me, the mm -hmm. man walking down the road. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't want to leave. Leaving. Mm -hmm. Leaving is what's hard. Going in is easy. Leaving is hard. It's really, really hard. At the end of the day, I walk out. They stay. 
Thank you so much for being here with us today. And it's been absolutely wonderful to hear about, wonderful, very moving to hear about your work and, and your situation. And I want to say thank you for the audience that you popped in and taken part of this. And next week, we're going to release another interview, another conversation with the musician and his daughter, Costa Petria and Emma Petria. And they're working together. And how's that going? And they're releasing music. And they might do a, a spontaneous thing here uh, on stage with me. So tune in then in a week. And if you want to leave a comment, do that or ask some questions, do that. Take care. Bye. Yeah.